and Tom Gibson is here somewhere in the room, who also works with us in the restoration of the Garvey and the reproduction for the New Jersey Friends of Clearwater. And Michael Humphreys, who's our publicist, is where? Right there, standing on the pole. Okay. I hope I haven't forgotten any of our committee. These are the board members who are responsible for organizing this event. And Barbara Ladoulis, my significant other here, as with Amy and with uh, some people who couldn't be here, Gloria and uh, Irene have assembled some of the refreshments. So I'm going to turn the meeting over now to begin uh, with our first speaker, and that's uh, Greg Strand, who is historian for the North Shrewsbury Ice Boat and Yacht Club. Correct? All right, Greg. <laughs> And X marks the spot. That's I've never used a mic before. Okay. Can you hear me good? All right. First of all, I want to thank about eight gentlemen from Red Bank, the merchants that put on uh, the Ice Boat Club over here, and they finally um, got together. They knew how wonderful this river was in, in uh, soft water sailing, so they wanted to do ice boating. And they were very wealthy uh, individuals, and they made that Ice Boat Club over here in 1880. And I want to thank them because without them, we would never have the great ice boat club that we have here and everything on the Red Bank River is for ice boating. As you do know, the, uh, the symbol for Red Bank on all the police car doors and on the center of town is an ice boat. That uh, is a boat called the Scud, which was our famous boat. Oh, sit in the spot. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I've, uh, I've been an ice boater for a long time. I had my first ride when I was 10 years old on the, on the South Shrewsbury River. And ironically, on that particular first ride, we fell through the ice and, and uh, I had to walk home. But it didn't deter me from loving this sport. And I got to see the big A boats on the, on the uh, Long Branch River. I joined, after sailing there for my early youth, I, I grew up uh, with a man who owned an ice boat. He was an Olympic ice skater, so I had an ice boat at my disposal. So in 1967, I believe the Ice Boat Club over here had uh, run on some hard times. A lot of the, the people had died off, uh, boats were in storage, and they had an auction. They put 16 boats out on the, in the parking lot to buy. And I walked in as a 17-year-old boy, and, and I fell in love with a, a boat that I wanted. And these older individuals came over to me and said, uh, you don't want that boat. Uh, take this boat over here. And I said, why? Why should I take that one? Because uh, we're going to pay for it with you. We'll help you uh, uh, afford it. So I was able to buy a boat, which was a Marconi rig ice boat. Marconis were the, the, the cream of the crop in the day. They came out in the, in the late 30s and uh, were, were made. But there was a method to their reasoning here because they only had two other Marconis that were actively sailing and they needed a third one. So I happened to be the guy that they stuck with buying that boat. But I ended up making it run really good and I was a champ. The boat was a champ for many, many years. But uh, in campaigning it, I decided to join the Hudson River Ice Boat Club about 1970. And I just want to thank John Spur over here. He's a member of the Hudson Club. He came down. He's, he has his own website on ice boating, and, and he's a great sailor. And I'm glad that he came down here uh, to our uh, talk today. And uh, that's fabulous. Uh, but he's, he's been a real uh, force up there in, in the Hudson for um, the ice boating. So joining their club in 1970, I then went to Orange Lake and uh, I helped on rebuilding the Jack Frost in 1973 through 75, which was a, a, a 49 foot, uh, almost 50 foot long ice boat that was very, very famous, owned by Archibald Rogers, who was the president of Standard Oil Company in the day up on, uh, in and around the uh, Hudson River by uh, Hyde Park. Uh, consequently, right after that, I joined the Hudson, I mean, the Long Branch Ice Boat and Yacht Club. And they were uh, wonderful. The, the old timers, uh, they had the same situation where they weren't using their boats too much. So they had a, a, a group of people that was a splinter group that broke off from the regular club, but they were strictly sailing the stern steers, the big 30 footers. And so they took me under their wing. So I got a lot of knowledge from those guys, a lot of knowledge from the early guys from the Hudson who revived the sport of ice boating, Ray Ruge in particular. He was the, a force in, in 1964. He, he decided to bring ice boating alive because it had been so dormant. And with that growth, we had the growth down here. I restored about 14 of the big A boats myself and owned them and sailed them. And I enjoy the sport, it's my passion. Uh, the big boats are my passion. And now with the rocket, the finishing of the rocket, it was something I really enjoyed. I, I helped get the cockpit out from under our club 
to uh, look at it, to make a replica uh, of half scale, and then I brought it back to the club and decided we we're going to do the, the full thing. And the, the men, John Holian and Bob Polch, thank God Bob, over there, spearheaded everything with John Holian, and the rocket became uh, what it is today, and it was done on a 10-year restoration, and it sailed uh, on March 1st for the first outing of, of this year. But it was built in 1888 and it hadn't been on the ice in probably 100 years. It was stored under the Ice Book Club. Another person I'd like to thank was John Darling, who was our custodial member of our Ice Boat Club. He took care of the remaining parts of that rocket under that club, meticulously going under and making sure that whatever was left there stayed in good shape. And he, he was our member for about 50 some years and a tremendous uh, a guy. And we have a race that we run out here called the John Darling Memorial Race. Those are some of the um, people here. Uh, I want to just tell you, people that don't know much about ice boating, how it all started. You know, as you do know, the, the Dutch settlers came here to the Hudson Valley and they, and they brought with them the sport of ice boating. And uh, around the 1700s, their, their deal was to take a boat and, and just put a plank under a regular soft water boat and then put two runners on the end of the, the soft, uh, the, the port and starve and then and, uh, on the big barn door uh, tiller that they sailed the boat with, they would put a, a, a piece of steel underneath there and, and they would sail on the Hudson River doing that. And then as time went on, that was around 1700. Time went on, things had to change up because it wasn't really going to perform very well. And so a guy named Oliver Booth uh, up there made a boat that was more or less a box and he put the, the rudder in, in the box and the mast was in the box and he had a, 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 a jib off the front. Obviously it's a, it was a forerunner uh, thing and it didn't really go good either, but he was progressing along. So things got better and better and more people were experimenting with it. And of course speed is your biggest uh, thing. They want performance and speed and they weren't gonna get it too much with that, that uh, thing. So along came uh, the side railer boat, which was, uh, I have some pictures of the side railers here. I don't know if you can see some of them. You can see them reared up here. The cockpit was in the back, but the, it was big timbers that went out to a runner plank, and they were very rigid. And um, they had a, for ballast, they used to have to put people out on the runner plank, and uh, they were paid a, a, a meager fee of a dollar a day to risk their lives out on that runner plank for, to keep them from hiking up. And things were pretty stiff. Everything in those days was the stiffer the better because they would go out in any kind of uh, wind condition, especially on the Hudson River. And, uh, and uh, with all the, um, the ice that was chunked up and the hummocks and stuff like that, whatever they, you know, they it would hit, they needed something very strong. They even used a steel rod to, to hold them in, in, in later dates, uh, the, from the bow to the stern to the ends of the runner plank to keep them square. That was after the side railer. Side railer was all uh, wood construction. And the mast was placed right over top of the runner plank. And some of those pictures, I, I, you may see it. Particularly being over the runner plank like that, they did not, did not know that, that what it did to the performance of the boat. They thought the more sail you could put on a boat, the better it was going to be. But what happened is the force of effort and the force of resistance. The force of resistance is the runner plank itself on the boat, the force of efforts in the sail, and they, they were right over uh, opposing each other, and it, the boat was like a teeter-totter, and then it would spin, and in the back end, uh, there would be too much leeward pressure on the tiller, and the boat would sl slide out, or we call it a flicker, and they would reverse itself, uh, do a 180 degree spin, and throw everybody off. So as they started experimenting more, about 1871, Somebody, uh, uh, Captain Relier uh, out of uh, Athens, I believe. Um, uh, Hold on one sec. Sorry. Go. <laughs> Go. Anyhow, he, this Captain Relier uh, built a boat called the Great Scott, and, 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 and in, in return, he, he didn't use the side rails on this, on this particular boat. I got this all right, John. I, I think I do. So uh, he used a long uh, vertical, uh, I mean, uh, a long uh, uh, keel had a one piece of um, wood, and then he had the runner plank, and, and he, he used cables, and did away with the side rail construction, that, that, and that, that gave it all the weight, and he put cables on to hold it in, almost like a kite would be uh, made together, and then away this thing would go. And they decided at that time to move the mast off of the runner plank and move it forward three feet. And what that did was put the center of effort back a little bit further on the boat. They shortened the, 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 the jib in the front, 
originally these boats had so much sail they were way out the front, way out the back, and now he's made a balanced boat out of it, and, and that took off in a way it went for the future construction of those boats, and the controllability was there, and uh, so the speeds came up. About what year was that? About in 1871, I think. It was up there. The first ice boats are going back, you know, I, I got to bounce around and it's all up in my head, right? So uh, a guy named Percy Ashley was a guy who was very big on ice boat designs and he was, he was uh, thinking this stuff up in the, in the, in the uh, uh, early, uh, late 1700s. And he made a lot of designs and, and a lot of the boats eventually went to his design, but a lot of them went to the, um, the design of the Great Scott, uh, I, I believe. And, um, but anyhow, Make a long story short, they got better and better and better. So, right around the Civil War, a lot of people in our country made some major freight money, and they decided that they were going to get into the sport big and heavy. And all through the Hudson Valley, money was no object for building the boats. And a lot of the, uh, the boats were just gorgeous. And um, this fellow by the name of Irving Grinnell, he was a, a commodore of the, of the um, New Hamburg Club, he, he built a boat called a Whiff. And the width was 40 feet long, and it was, it was a side railer, and it was it was built specifically for the Philadelphia Exposition in 1876, and the workmanship was incredible. It uh, it had a lot of walnut on it, and white pine, and um, they had uh, in, uh, like a, a, a relief a, a etching of a dragon on it um, with the wings of a dragon. The boat was beautiful. The boat exists today. It, it's uh, owned by the Hudson River Club, but it's on display at the uh, Kingston Maritime Museum. Uh, Wait, huh? It, it's in a barn, right? Oh, it, it is in a barn? Okay. That's the icicle. Yeah, the icicle's up there too. I thought the whip was there too. Yeah. Um, but anyhow, this boat blew everything out of the water, but it was a side railer. It, 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 it was still something that nobody had really seen before, but the Philadelphia Exposition people came in droves. They saw the boat, they saw the introduction to ice boating and they went crazy. And they all started building ice boats and it, it spread from the Hudson Valley down here. We were still experimenting too here, but uh, the better boats were starting to come here. They went to uh, the Ohio, out to Canada, up to Canada rather, out to Michigan, Wisconsin. It just blew up. And at one time, uh, I think Frank Leslie's cassette, at one time in 1866 prior to this, said there was about 100 boats on the Hudson River. And, but once this boat took on, Everybody was excited and they were building the boats. But going back to the wealth that came by, after the exposition, people started building bigger and better boats. Uh, the America's Cup technology started to take hold in the 1880s, and that was the heyday of, of ice boating in, in our country, especially along the Hudson. You had the, the very wealthy up there. Uh, Archibald Rogers was a, uh, he lived two doors away from the Roosevelt's, John Roosevelt, which is the uncle to Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, John Roosevelt had the icicle. The first icicle was built in 1879. She was 68 feet 10 inches long, carried 1,070 uh, square feet of sail. And this boat was horrendous and very, very big. And it took a crew, a, a big crew to, to do it. But again, she was of the old design. And that boat in 1871 supposedly um, raced against the uh, Chicago Express, on the, which is now the Amtrak Railroad, going down the east side of the Hudson River, and and from uh, Poughkeepsie to Ossining, uh, beat the train. Uh, but I heard stories that the train stopped a couple times. But I don't know <laughs> to pick up passengers. But I don't know. But uh, I I can't see a boat of that size going faster than 40 or 50 miles an hour. But they would go out in a gale and. The best thing about the Hudson River, it's, it's, it's north and south, and you get a northwest wind, you're on a, a, a broad uh, reach going up, and the same thing coming back, you're going to hit the maximum speeds. And you can go, uh, I think they were traveling from Poughkeepsie to Hamburg, what, seven miles or nine miles? I forget how big it is. But once you get a boat going, you know, it, it's just, it's awesome. Because the ice boat runners are such, they're so sharp and so much weight on board that the force of the wind on a, on a broad reach is going to get you going pretty fast, two or three times the speed of the wind. And then the runners are digging in, so it's giving that force forward, and it's got lift on board, you know, to get the boat to go faster. So you can get great speeds by, by doing that. When you sail different kinds of courses, you're not going to get that kind of speed, especially the courses that we have down here. Okay, so 
money was no objects when they built the, uh, those boats in the 1880s. They had the uh, new icicle that came out, which uh, John was just talking about is at the Kingston Maritime Museum. And she, I believe, was close to 50 feet. And, uh, but she's state of the art, and she was built by uh, uh, Jacob uh, Buckout and, and his son George Buckout uh, were the best builders, I guess, at the time. Wouldn't you say, John? Yes. Absolutely the best builders, and I, I fell in love with their kinds of boats. But they built the, um, the Jack Frost, and they built the Icicle Number 2. And because they were in such competition with each other, these two owners and two sailors, they, they, they had the greatest racing. A fellow by the name of Irving Grinnell, who had the whiff, who built the whiff, decided to put a pennant up, a 30-foot long pennant that was called the First Class Challenge Pennant of America for the big boats to run over a 20-mile course on the Hudson River. And in those days, that was a big deal. They draw a 1,000 people come out and watch this race. And it was race for uh, from 1881, I believe, all the way until 1922. But the highlight was 1881 to 1902, when they had the, the big ones. Once they got past that, the big ones couldn't go on the ice too much, for icebreakers were cutting uh, the, the channel in, and they couldn't get the run. But our club here had two class one ice boats, like the Jack Frost or the Ice School, and we would send two boats up to race against them. Our club was formed in 1880. About 1984, I believe, the Scud was built. And the Scud was built to go up and challenge that, for that race up here. The Jack Frost was 1883. The Icicle was 1882. We had other big boats up at the time. One was called the Hayes, one was called the Northern Life, all in that time period, all with heavy money backing the boats to build back then, I believe, now I'm not totally sure, it was only about $450, $500 back at the you know, 1880s, and that was a lot of money, you know, but uh, they were craftsmen, and, and these Buckout boats were just phenomenal. And so they made these races go off, and I think it ran off 15 times um, up until 1902. Uh, we in Red Bank never won any of those races up there. Uh, five times were won by the Jack Frost, four by the Icicle, we had one by the Great Scott, we had uh, one by the Hayes, one by the Northern Light, I can't remember the rest of them, but after 1902, times changed in our country, particularly shipping started to come down that Hudson River, so they cut the, uh, the channel in pretty good, and when they did that, the boats could not move at width when they had four or five of them together, or six of them together. And, uh, the, the things started to fall apart uh, at that time. And uh, particularly after that time, they did come down here on occasions. 1906, some of them came down here to sail on this river. This river really isn't big enough to pull a race of that uh, magnitude off, but we did have a 1906 race where the rocket of all uh, boats had, had participated here. Now the rocket, they tell me, um, when I first came into the club, they had it hidden under the ice boat club, and, and uh, I was a 17-year-old kid coming in here, and they didn't want me to come and see that boat, and they wouldn't let anybody look underneath. But I made friends with this John Darling, who was our caretaker, and he let me go down and look at it all and learn as much as I could with it. The boat was originally built to run up on the Hudson, however, it never did. Uh, and it was left to the club in 1922, and therefore it was put in storage all those years. And it was just uh, something that was there to defend a certain cup. And the cup is the Venostrian cup that the boat was there really to defend. And, and nobody, nobody, we never did anything with it. The Venostrian cup was put up by a gardener Venostrian uh, out of Orange Lake in 1889. And um, it's uh, a 30 ounce, uh, I mean 70 ounces of silver. It's a cup that was uh, reliefed. Uh, for Tiffany's, a beautiful cup, and um, of all things, the only cup that we won up there was that cup in, in 1891, and uh, consequently, it's been raced for two times since. Uh, I'll, I'll refer to that in a few minutes, but that boat, the, the uh, rocket, was really put there for that reason, and, uh, but it never materialized. That boat couldn't handle uh, going up, and then it fell on bad times. We had another boat called the Dreadnought. The Dreadnought was a boat that was run by Cap Irwin over here at the Irwin's Yacht Works. They're, they were a tremendous uh, family of ice boaters, very good ice boaters, by the way. But again, they couldn't win that race on the Hudson River because we're, this river here is much different as well as the Long Branch River. The Long Branch Club was built, uh, originated in 1902. 
and there's a big wide open space over there, there's no hills, like we have hills here. So when you have hills on this ice boat club, the force of effort in the sail is a little, going to be a little higher. We peak our sails higher if they're gaff riggers, and we, we seem to run better. On the other river, it, you got more open spots, and, and it's a different avenue to race on, and the Hudson is even harder. The Hudson River, the, the force of effort on the sail comes real low. I remember going up there with my Marconi and not, not doing very well at Orange Lake or uh, any of the Hudson. Um, they have their own style of boat. They're used to tougher ice than we are down here. Uh, and it was just a wonderful thing. But you, you, you have to have great sailors, and you have to have, there's three different kinds of venues that you go on. You know, even if you go on a lake, it's a little bit different. So it's tougher if when you leave this area, go to another area to race. Um, but anyhow, the challenges were, were cool. Uh, we traveled all with these boats out of my club. Now, in 1880, after the big boats uh, kind of died, in the turn of uh, uh, 1910, 1920, they were pretty much all gone. The class three boat, I have two models here. This is a class three boat, the smaller one. That was uh, a class one, it's missing the jib, but uh, that class one boat is much bigger, as you can see. 50 feet down to 30 or 32 feet on the, on the class three. A track of uh, 25 to 30 on the big boat, and a track over here of uh, maybe anywhere from 15 to uh, 20 on the on the smaller boat. The smaller boats were better because they were easier to uh, handle, and they were more conducive to the sailing conditions that we have here. And they blossomed out. I figure about um, from the turn of the century on here, we probably had 45 to 50 big boats between this club and the Long Branch Club. I mean, not the big boats, but the small boats. Now up in the Hudson. <coughs> They, they had gone to the smaller boat as well. And then they got smaller. Uh, as ice conditions, you need, you need 12 inches of ice for the big boat. The 30-footer, you need about maybe six or higher. We like eight. Uh, and then they made smaller boats, which would drop down the sail areas. The sail area on the small boat was about um, 350 square feet. The bigger boat, you're running anywhere from 550 to 1,000. The rocket, I believe, has 850. And so the performance of the big boat to the little boat, the big boat's like a, I, I, I could, uh, consider it like a bulldozer, out of control bulldozer. You're not going to stop it too well once it gets rolling. The little boat, you can spill out the air out pretty good. So the competition was keen here. We put up a pennant here, uh, actually Long Branch did, it's called the third class pennant of America for the 30 footers. And the Georgie, it's being restored over in the other club. If you guys want to go over later, you can see it being restored over there. The Georgie is pictured in that last photograph down at the at back end. It was built in 1904 by Cap Irwin's father. And Cap Irwin was the sailor on it. And on the first year, 1904, they had 29 starts with that boat. And it won 24 races. And the rest it came in second or third. So it was probably our best overall boat. She was very small. Very docile, and that's turned to be a, a thing for the future for ice boating. Let's go down, well, let's get the size down. It, it's better to use and stuff like that. So that boat sported 350 square feet of sail, but it was 23 feet long, and it was very light. And you had to be a, a, a magical sailor to sail that with any kind of experience and expertise. So anyhow, it, it became one of our, our best boats, and it still is today if we get it back out. Now, it's been going through a restoration, and I'm sure it'll be here. Now, Cap Irwin was accused of cheating with that boat on the sail area, because the boat was 23 feet long and everybody else was 30, and they're going, hey, what the heck's going on here? You got too much sail. And he, if you notice in the pictures, his jib sticks way out past the, the, the nose of the boat. So he got angry. And you know, I guess when you get a captain angry, it's pretty bad. So he took the boat off of competition for 23 years and never came back out. But that boat was built in 1883. And so in 1909, he built a second one, which is a Georgie number no. two, and the Georgie number no. two traveled with us up to the Hudson River this past March 1st, and she run like heck, you know, and he just wanted to prove a point. Okay, guys, you think I'm cheating, I'm gonna build another one, and it's gonna be 32 feet long, and it's gonna carry 350 square feet of sail, and it became so fast, and so he proved them all wrong. And then the, the little boat came back out again and sailed in uh, the second Benostrin race that we had, that's for that trophy. We had a race in uh, 1978. That boat came out and sailed and won one of the heats. But uh, ice boating grew all over the place. And we, we decided that it's better to have something smaller. And then in the 30s, they came out, uh, 1937, they came out with a design of a boat that was 12 feet long called the DN. And they, 
they named it on, on a newspaper article uh, contest, and it came out as the, the D Detroit News the newspaper put it on. And out came a 12-foot boat, and it was designated a DN-60. And uh, Phil Tucker is out here. He was a DNer right, somewhere along in here. Uh, but anyhow, um, it, it was a fast boat, do 60 miles an hour, and now it's the most prolific boat in, uh, on the planet. It's all over the world sailing, in the northern countries, obviously. But uh, the competition is so keen. The new boats are so expensive, but the ease of portability, of, uh, they put them on airplanes, they fly them overseas, stuff like that, so it really uh, kept the sport alive. There were other modern classes that come up and, and showed things too, you know, with different uh, variations carrying two people or, or three people. The lure of the big boat is fantastic. For me, to go on any big boat is, is the excitement, number one, is this river. This river is the most beautiful river on the planet. I race Jersey speed skips around the country, and I also raced ice boats around the country, and I, I love this river. It's, it's, the, the hills are just magnificent. But anyhow, um, the draw is the lure of that boating, it, because when you sail these things, I don't care how good a sailor you are, and I am by far not a good one, but that thing will kick your butt when you sail that thing. And you're talking 50 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, you're six inches off the deck, and when she decides that she's gonna throw you off, you're going off. There's no, 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 no ifs, ands, or buts. And I love the ride on the edge. For me, that's the lure. But you have a sheet tender that's sailing with you, and you can blame everything on him. So he's not, he's not letting out the sheet or whatever. On the big boats, when you're sailing a big boat, you have to have her strapped down all the time. You don't wanna get any air, in the in a pocket in the sail, and particularly the jib has to be tended. So they run three people. Somebody runs the jib. Now the smaller boats you can get away with. The, the helmsman would run the jib as well. And, and when you turn them, you need somebody on the jib. In the 1978 race, we were out here at Red Bank, and the uh, the Jack Frost was in the race and and went up to the the top mark, really doing well. But nobody had a hold of the jib, and all of a sudden she flickered and spun. 360 degrees and threw everybody off. And I happened to be behind them, so I got to see it full hand, what it's like to get thrown off of something 50 feet long. But uh, you always have to have that third person. So now you can blame not just the sheet tender, you can blame the jib, the jib tender as well. But I love the camaraderie and the people, the experiences of meeting the people that want to help preserve these 100-year-old craft. And everybody helps everybody else. And you know, it's. I remember one time, it, I used to complain because it took me to, at a race, it would take me uh, two and a half hours, three hours to assemble everybody's boat plus mine. And I said, my God, I'm going to make a trailer that I can assemble my boat in an hour and I'm good to go. Guess what? I forgot I have to help everybody else do theirs. So I'm still up to two and a half, three hours. But anyhow, that's what, it, it just brought the, uh, the sport alive in 1964. The Hudson River Club, I believe their, their date of uh, incorporation was 1885. They used to be the Poughkeepsie Club. And there was some, I heard there was some sailing uh, um, refereeing uh, problem, uh, uh, a contested uh, event up on the top state. And uh, back in the 18, they were, uh, the Poughkeepsie was 1861, their club. And most of those guys were in that club and they decided, wow, there's some kind of problem here. So they formed the Hudson River Club, it was 1885. But really, it, they all blended together. But the, the sport, took on a, a new meeting with the big boats. I, I keep flip-flopping, but I gotta get, bring it up to you. The, right. the big boats. One <laughs> sec. Go. The big boats brought in the romance of this thing. With the money and the high-end, uh, uh, the, the looks and how uh, pretty they were and the money factor uh, back in there and uh, the excitement, uh, it, it just, it just brought it right up to the, the, the Victorian age and everybody just loved it. I mean, and, and that, that's what we all lean back on. The glue that holds that ice boat club together and the glue that holds your, our club together, you and I, is the big boats. The boats have been passed on from generation to generation. It's the boats that holds everything together here, just like it is in, in this club. They've been passed on from uh, uh, father to son, if that's the case, or when they let them go and let somebody restore them for future generations to see. I figured, I said 50 boats were here in the, between the two rivers, I believe there's 32 of them left. So a lot of them stayed here. And uh, the last A boat that was ever built in, the, in the, the Northeast was a boat called the Vanguard, which I, I have sailed and I still continue to sail. And the Vanguard was built in 1958 by Pete Wingerter and it was the fastest A boat on our rivers here. It was a Marconi rigged A boat. Like I said, the Marconis were a different kind of a breed. They were taller, 
30, 34 foot high, 36 foot high mast, sent our efforts way up. When they started being built in our, our country by Jacob Buckout, again up from Poughkeepsie, he was the best boat builder, these boats were unbeatable. The speeds went way up on these boats, and we had two or three of them here. The uh, challenge pennant of, a, uh, of third class was put up by Long Branch, and we were never able to win that again, but once the Marconi rigs came into existence, then we started winning, and we won and won and won with those things. A boat called the, Jack, uh, the, uh, the uh, Eskimo, and, and, the, um, and the other one was the Pirate. And they were built in 1939, 37, and they were owned by Jacob Rupert and, uh, and Gillig. And they were the owners of the New York Yankees. Again, big money people coming in. And they were un unbeatable. But that was what really pushed the envelope for speed. And that's what I ended up in. I got pushed over onto the speed side. When Ray Ruge brought ice boating back to America, he brought it back from the wealthy to the commoner. And, and let it become a recreational sport as opposed to one of these things where, you know, uh, it was for the rich and wealthy. And so we were all able, thanks to him, to be able to uh, participate in this sport. But you can get carried away with this like anything else. But here's a picture down here that I, I cherish. It's uh, the icicle, a picture of the icicle with the Jack Frost supposedly running against the train. Those two boats exist today, like I said. In uh, the, the 1973, the Jack Frost was uh, uh, rebuilt and I would go up there and help rebuild it. Now John Spur came from New York down the opposite way to help rebuild the rocket. The rocket took 10 years. That boat took about uh, three, three years, I believe. Again, they were both similar. The, the remains of the Jack Frost were found in the, in the beach area and they, they had to work around a rig. They had an original rig that Rick Aldridge had up uh, at Rokeby. He had it in the sail barn of the original boat. The icicle uh, is pretty much complete, and that's in, uh, that's in the museum, but it will never be used. We, we, we had hopes of it being used, but it will never be used because it's an artifact of uh, the Roosevelt uh, campaign. Now, President Roosevelt's uncle ran the icicle, but President Theodore Roosevelt was an ice boater. His mother bought him an ice boat in 1901. He was a Harvard student at the time, and he sailed it for four years. It's up at the Hyde Park um, Museum, and they let what? Franklin. Oh, Franklin. Franklin. Uh, uh, Franklin. Yeah. But um, they let it out for 24 hours, right? Recently, yeah. so everybody could see it. It's locked away again. It's an artifact, never to be used. As well as the pennant that I talked about, the the 30 foot long pennant uh, from the uh, first first class challenge, the big boat challenge is up there at the museum also. But um, yeah, that's good. Um, there's other pictures of the boats and stuff. This one model, I, I got to tell you about this one model. It's so cool. But. I, uh, I, love the, I love the models. This is an authentic 100-year-old model, or more than 100 years old. And there's a picture of this model on the ice here at Red Bank. A little boy is holding it in his hands. And I was able to purchase this model back in 1970. And I, I just loved it. It sailed at Central Park. Now, a lot of these owners, a lot of these people were from the New York area and worked in the city. And if they didn't um, ice boat where well, the weathers weren't conditioned to them to get on the on the ice they would make a model and they would sail it at central park and stuff that's an actual sailing model i've sailed it on the river here in about 20 knots of wind i had a bunch of kids go down river and i let it loose and it just goes right on down and they would fetch it up for me and bring it back the runners are all uh, all done up on it so this is this is that old it's it, it's so cool um but that's what they did you know they thought ice all the time and i, I guess with the setting here in Red Bank with the paddle wheel boats at the, in the, in the turn of the century and all the way up into the early 20s, and Red Bank was a, a commercial hub, particularly for tomatoes. They would you know, come in here and take tomatoes to the city, but they had this beautiful river here, and it was used to the max. They had ice carnivals. There's pictures of ice carnivals here. On uh, People would come down and sit in a seat. I think it was a penny to sit there all day, and they, had, they put a little uh, pot underneath you the, with some hot coals to keep your tush warm. So, and, uh, but sailing out on the ice was, was, the, uh, was some, I've seen as many as 2,000 people on the ice here at Red Bank watching us race. And, and racing to me is, is the best way to go. Um, and I, I just love the sport. And uh, some of these other pictures are, are Red Bank at the time period, some of the Hudson. Look at them, see some of these famous pictures. But I have a couple of videos I want to show you. But if you have any questions, you know, feel free to ask me. But that's about it. Long Branch, by the way, there was, I gotta tell you, a lot of people say speed records, speed records. They always talk about speed records. They said the Scud 
on the Hudson River exceeded 109 miles an hour in 1891. Oof. I don't know if I'd want to be on that, baby. I don't know if I could ever see that. But um, then it gets better. Over in Long Branch, a boat called the Clarel in 1909 was supposed to have exceeded 142 miles an hour. <laughs> Three men were timing it on a run. Now, in those days, they ran a triangle course, so there's really there's speed, space out there, but not a lot of space. But I also found out from talking to the old timers that helped me out that the, the men that timed her were working in the Rumson Country Club, uh, uh, having some uh, extracurricular uh, beverages. So I don't know if, if that was a true fact, but 142 miles an hour, who knows? But uh, at any rate, um, they sailed out of the, uh, out of the Rumson Country Club in 1909. They had a tremendous group of people that ran their boats. And they would swap boats out. It was not unusual to have a boat be in Red Bank or Long Branch or, or Red Bank, to, it, it, I mean, or, uh, or Rumson, and go around the hub. And uh, as long as they were sailing, that's all they believed in, is to sail these things. And that's what we have to do. We're worried about our future, young people wanting to get into the sport. And it, it's scary to think. We have so many other things out of our capabilities, and you know that we want to bring young people in. So anytime a young person comes down here, or anybody in particular, we give them a ride, and we try to give them as much uh, uh, friendliness and, and take them into the ice boat club, see that. But you know, it's it's hard to keep somebody interested in it when the ice is not here all the time. You have to travel for the ice. We've traveled as far as Maryland. We've gone to Wisconsin. We've gone everywhere. Jeff Smith just came back from Wisconsin, but. Um, that's what you have to do to keep the sport alive. The future of this sport is these old boats that will always draw the people in, and we have to keep them going. And uh, so, uh, huh? CD. Oh, I want to show you a CD. I have a picture of uh, of up on the Hudson. We're going to show uh, CDs of rocket. Huh? Can we get the building? Yeah, sure. We we got a pictures of of the rocket sailing, but I want to show you the Jack Frost sailing. I, I sailed the Jack up there a few years ago. Well, it's ironic that we never sail in, in, in March too much, but it's ironic that the, side, the day we take the rocket up is March 1st, 2014, and we were up there 11 years prior to that on March 1st in 2004, and I thought that was kind of cool. We never sail in March too much. I think the furthest I've ever gone was March 17th in one year. Uh, I checked back through all the records of my ice boat club and see the temperature ranges and, and how the averages go. And we always say that we sail somewhere in Red Bank most of the time. I didn't sail last year in Red Bank because we had no ice. But every 10 years or so, we get a blasted winter. And um, back in 78, that was one of those big winters. We had 31 inches of ice out there. And I have pictures up here of me sailing after the spring had come, pretty much in the, in, uh, the spring weather. I was sailing in 70 degree weather on, on about eight inches of ice out here because we had that much ice. Um, but in that first, or the second Finosteran race, we had uh, 17 A boats on the starting line. And I have a video of that standing there um, watching all 17. And it, it's, it's incredible to see that many pieces of boats up there. Now I think we had, what, 16 or 17 up there on March 1st, and then it, it grew to stern steers with maybe 25, maybe? I counted 30. You counted 30, okay. Said 32. Isn't that amazing to have that many come out? That had to be the best ever. Huh? Yeah, but I'm in a stern steerers, you know. Yeah. Yeah. How many people here have ever been on an ice boat? Yeah, probably a few of you. Yeah. There's Bill Camilla back there, like member of the North Shoes Brain, ex Commodore. How you doing? But yeah, um, I'm going to tell you, if you ever get an experience to go on it, do it. You're going to love it. Yeah. Greg, uh, you, you raised an interesting subject. Is there a uh, is there a real global warming decline as far as the real ice boating ice is concerned? I don't think so. Um, I, I think it's just it's been cyclical all that time. I just don't uh, buy into it too much about the global warming side of it. Uh, that we're, we're that's part of the thing that we lost interest in. I and, and the ability to ice boat race. I think a couple things factor into the to the when we do get ice here, it takes like two weeks to grow. And a lot of times on a, like the third week, you could come out here and we're all like comfortable in our rooms and we don't wanna go outside or we got something else going on. So the uh, traction to ice boating slims down. So you only have the diehards going out. 
uh, I think the weather's still there. If you travel, yeah, you know, we, uh, fortunately, we, get, we don't get a lot of snow here, and if, if we do get a lot of snow, it, it, it lays in the ice and freezes up, and we get some, some ice out of it. Uh, but I don't know about that. I think it's every 10 years, it's, you know, that's the way it's going to be. Um, and that's the way it's been, too? It has. I've, gone, I've looked through the records all the way back in the 1880s. That, that's what I was wondering. Every 10 years is a major big uh, a length of uh, time. You're right? Yep. Okay. No, uh, it's one. It's say on chapter nine. Look at. Uh, can you click? Can you click through to chapter nine? Or not coming up on your thing? Uh, Greg, do you think that like we have fewer weak seasons, and how much fewer seasons? Yeah. Where you get a little yeah. Bit yeah, I think we get less, less and less each in, the, in the middle years. We get less time to sail. Look at This is a, this is in two thousand and oh three, two thousand three. So that's me uh, in front of all. Of, I tried for thirty seven years to get on the ice up at the Hudson, and we got them all lined up. Uh, oh. Thank you. Now this this was increased double up, up, up this past uh, year. There, there's the Jack Frost. You can see the size of that guy compared to the other ones. There's a Marconi in there and a couple other boats. There's I think 15 on the line. You can you, you want to skip forward a little bit? You'll see where it's actually sailing the big boat. That's the Vanguard. Marconi. Yeah, the Vanguard. Yeah, I've sailed that Vanguard. Boy, she is one fast. Here. It, all right, this is uh, sailing. Uh, can you raise the sound? Because it's, you know, I want you to get the sound. In. You can back this up a little bit. Can you back it up? Because I want to show the height of the sail. All right, I guess you. Anyhow, when you sail the big boats, the, the sail area is so huge. I, I've sailed the Jack Frost when it was the original sail, which was about um, over 800. And now it's down to 650, if I'm not mistaken, on the new sail. That's the new sail right there for the Jack Frost. I wanted to show you the Jack Frost before we get to the uh, to the um, rocket to show you the differences in the boat. Yeah. Ice is very rough up there compared to down here. See the boat actually sailing. All right, look, this is good. Leave on that side as you jump right to it. Can you back up where the two were together? Sorry. That again is the Marconi. wasn't cooperating, but then it picked up and we were able to go. Uh, why don't you show you the size difference between one of our big A boats and one of theirs. sail in the middle there is a Rip Van Winkle that Rick Aldrich has, who lives up at Rokeby, that had us come up and sail. She's a, what is she, about 40 foot long? 40 foot. And do you any conditions at the Hudson weren't any good? Well, in that particular day, it was kind of soft ice, but there's a difference between the two big boats. That's a, one of our A boats there. Bear with me a minute, he's just trying to hook it up. There's the size difference. The jack crosses on the left. 
see the staff. Haven't seen her since 1977. But on the right is the now then from our club, Dan, uh, Danny Clapp, who ended up helming the, uh, the Jack Frost. That's a side railer there. That's the Mary Ellen. Here we go. Jack, Holy shit. Sorry about that. But this thing plows through ice, and it was digging in pretty tough, but she was moving. You can hear the ice crunching under there because of the weight. She's about 2,500 pounds. Oh, man, this is awesome. Right jack. And it was only pushing about maybe five or seven knots winds. Now, some of the newer boats, the Skeeters, are so well designed. They're the fastest in the, in the world. On a light wind, say seven knots of wind, they can do 10 times the speed of the wind. That big boat there is able to get maybe three at the most, maybe four. But the newer boats today could exceed 100. I don't believe any A boat, although it could come close. I think they're all in the 70 mile range or 80 mile range for the top end. There's so much sail area here. She should, she'll pick up speed pretty quick. You shake and bake back there. There's a term, shiver, shiver my timbers, is when the old boats were so thick, the runner planks were so thick, and your eye teeth would uh, bang, and, and you'd be really, every bone in your body would shake. That's the Marconi, the Vanguard next to it. I'm trying to hold a camera and she tended at the same time. It's pretty tough. <laughs> now the speeds the rocket ran this past March were much faster. That's the Rhinecliff Bridge there, Kingston Rhinecliff Bridge. They sailed under it this year. I think one of the boats went uh, all the way down the river to Kingston, and then uh, I think some of them went as much as 20 miles. The ice was so thick. Look at that, when it pan, that camera pans up to the top of the sail, how much sail area is up there. Does she what? Hike over? Yeah, they'll hike. Yeah. You feel the hear the wind going in the you know, you have to experience it to see how cool it is. A lot of the videos we made this year up at the Hudson didn't uh have that audio. Yeah. That is a Latine rig. That would, they, these Latine, that's the last one in existence that's still sailing. That was a, a Roosevelt boat. And Latines were on the a Long Branch River and the Red Bank River. Look at panning up to that big sail there. All right, you can stop this one. Yeah, my wife's gone faster than I have in an ice boat just by accident with the gentleman that was sailing with me in the, in the, in the jack. She got caught in a snow squall one day, and uh, I said, who is that fool out there sailing by? And it was my wife. But, uh, anyhow, um, on the spot, he says. Okay, we're going to try another video real quick to show here at Red Bank. And then uh, we have the Edison tape, but I don't know if you guys want to see that or not. Greg, how often did the rocket actually come out? Yeah. How many seasons? Back in the days? In total, yeah. I mean, I, we don't know. Don't know, but it wasn't very much used, actually. Well, here's the man who owned it was uh, 
was a name by the, na by the name of Cooley. And he was one of the founding members of our ice boat club. And he had a lot of money, I guess, and built that boat. Uh, we don't know where the boat was built. I do know that the Scud number one was built up by, by the Merrick brothers up in uh, Chelsea, New York. The second boat, I believe, was built here in Fairhaven. And it was built by a, name, by a man by the name of, of Chandler. I do believe the rocket was built by the same man. There's a big difference between the, 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 our boat and, and the Jack Frost. Uh, there's a big difference. And I do believe that they were built locally. I know I have read articles where the uh, Scud was taken out of, uh, out of Fairhaven and sailed, and the crew wanted to abandon ship because there was not enough room on that ice out there in, in Red Bank to handle it. Uh, how many times it was ever used? I know only one time that I've actually seen photographs, and that was 1906 against a boat called the Hayes out of, and the Northern Light out of uh, the Hudson right here at this river. I don't know uh, other, other times than that. We had to have a foot of ice to go do it, and with no snow and, and uh, great conditions. Maybe not, maybe not. I want you to look at this one. It shows the Venostrin race that we had in 78. The second running, we had uh, 21 stern steers, I guess. There's the lineup right here. And, uh, let's see. This is our river there, that's Range Avenue in the background. And we're all lining up. The breeze is pretty stiff. And this is where the, 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 the uh, Jack Frost lost control and spun out because nobody had the jib. We had a heck of a line of boats there. And sailing, you got to know right away with these things and the speeds, the closing speeds on them. It's pretty difficult. You know, you got guys going upwind, guys coming downwind. There's the Latine rig that's still there with the reed. I'm in the next boat, which was a, originally a cat rig uh, buckout boat, and I converted it to a boom and gap. But there's the lineup. It was pretty cool. Channing Irwin here, I think, wins the uh, this first race, I believe. But we had Ruben Snodgrass, uh, his name, uh, he was out of Long Island, well, Lake Ron Cottonmo, in a, in a 42 foot boat called the Cold Wave. That's Channing Irwin in that first boat there. That's that, uh, that again, that Georgie that's so quick. And uh, we could have lost this race very easily, uh, but we, we ended up as a three race series. But those were the conditions that particular day. And I think it was blowing about, you know, uh, 14 or 15 miles an hour. You know, a lot of stuff wasn't documented, but I had enough uh, uh, insight to bring a, uh, a camera and let somebody operate it for me. And I took pictures from inside the boat during the race. I was always keen on the history of this uh, sport. You got guys coming along. Ice boating came back alive in the 60s. It's, it, it, it's, it's really going strong now. I'm, I'm so faithful that it's going to hang in there. But that was the big, biggest gathering of Avos since last uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, that we ever had. Here's the Jack Frost, and we, we went out on, on a ride with our wives here. But we had, a, we had a man sitting on a runner plank with a camera so he could video this. And this, ironically, was the last class one to ever sail on our river. And this was 1978. And then um, hopefully we'll get the rocket to be the next one to come out. We technically should be wearing helmets out here, but we let the girls go on without helmets. <laughs> They're smarter than we are. Anyhow, this is looking up that sail. This is the original sail that was about 900 square feet. Look at the mast on this thing. It's getting up there 35, 45 miles an hour. There are in total three big boats, right? There's the rocket, Jack Frost, and a third out there still, right? Well, we have the icicle, yeah. That's it's still, it's in the museum. Oh, okay. no, it's but out west, out west they have bigger boats, uh, but they're modern. They're pretty modern. Okay. There's the deuce out there at 55 or 60 feet long. So there are only two of this type sailing. 
two, two sailing, yeah. Our dream was to have the third one sail. And, you know, I, it may come true. But the federal government has something to say about it in the state of New York. They think it's an artifact. Look at the size of that sail up there, would you? I took it for a ride one day on Orange Lake, and it took me 45 minutes to stop it. Every time I came around, the, the wind would get inside that great big sail and take <laughs> off again. I had a girl riding with me that had no coat, so she was really happy. <laughs> That's, uh, that's how much wind's there today. But there's a day that I was telling you about when it was 70 degrees out, and I'm gonna show, it's going to be in the next part of this video. And the Marconi was very fast that I, I, I built and owned, and here it is here. This is state-of-the-art for ice boats. It was, I could hike this thing up. It's 70 degrees, and I'm sailing on, on a layer of water. And she's just riding, the, riding up. You ask me if they healed over, there you go. I can hang, I can hang that thing forever up there. Where'd you make that sail? I built it in 1970. The sail and, and the mast is a 16-inch wide mast. Uh, I, I tried to go after the major speed like the guys out in the uh, Midwest did, uh, Wisconsin area. The mast was 36 feet high. The boat was 34. But she was very, very quick. Jack Melville from uh, Fairhaven was my sheet tender here. But this boat almost killed me one time. We broke through the ice. You can cancel it there. And uh, I got trapped under the ice out here. Um, and it was, it was, it was pretty bad. Uh, I can't swim, so I was going to try to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've raced boats all my life, and I can't swim. So, uh, I, you know, when you look like you're going into ice, you know, there's two things that go through your mind: is I got to get out of here. So I jumped. And jumping wasn't a good deal. You have a 50-50 shot of making it on top of the ice or under the ice. Well, I made it under the ice, so that, that was pretty bad. But Jack, my sheet tender, that's another thing, having a crew with you, he hung in there and stayed with me as I was locked up underneath the ice there. But uh, it didn't put a, it put a fear in me a little bit, but not enough to make me dislike the sport. So I was right back. And ironically, like anything else, when the, the horses get out of the barn, you close the doors. The next race, I had a life jacket on. <laughs> <laughs> I took it off, though. I took it off. <laughs> but anyhow, things you, you, you remember. OK, that's my two. Do you want to do the Edison video, or I don't know if you guys have time for that? Uh, or you want to go we'll, take a break? We'll, yeah, we'll take a break. I'll OK, thank you so much. Okay. How about we take a five-minute break, and then we'll uh, start up with our next presentation. Great. Copy and bagels here, then. To participate in the, uh, the opening ceremonies that we're going to have sometime in the future. And uh, as part of this year's events, there will be a special June commemoration of the 350th anniversary of the founding of Monmouth County, and we are organizing this trip on June 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th, and 9th. There's going to be a visit by a Dutch reproduction, a reproduction of the Dutch ship, the Armrust, from Schenectady, New York. It will be coming down and recreating the voyage from Gravesend, Brooklyn, to the Highlands, and then it will be visiting the Navasink River, including the Monmouth Boat Club, on uh, Friday night, the 5th of June here, right at the end of the tea dock, and there'll be a special uh, event that evening, and this club is reserved on that Friday evening, and you're all welcome to attend that, so you'll be on, you'll be on the uh, email calendars. The Armrust is going to be part of our uh, campaign to uh, attract sponsors, for the Navasink Maritime Association and the rehabilitation and reconstruction of the Grover House, as well as the design and development of a maritime waterfront center on the same site. So you'll have more news about that. And uh, Christine Burke is here today off on the side here. She is our lead uh, 
campaign manager, if you will, from Christine Burke Associates of Red Bank. And if you want more information, she has brought some information about that commemorative voyage of the onrus in June. And uh, I'm happy to tell you about it. If you have any people that, that you would like to have this information forwarded to, you let us know or talk to my companies. If any of you haven't yet signed in, if you do that, you'll get the newsletters that will tell you what's going on with the next presentation we've got, with the onrus coming, with Grover House. You've got to be on our email list to get the newsletter. So you okay. can sign in if you haven't done already over there. Okay. And we have our very active website, which is managed in part by Tom Gibson and Michael Humphreys, uh, <coughs> that has this information. Okay. I think we're all back assembled. And let me... Uh, I'm going to ask you to introduce Bob. Okay. No? Do, you, do you want to do the Thomas Edison real quick? All right. Let's yeah. begin with the uh, uh, short clip. How many minutes? Are uh, we'll do it for about five minutes. Five-minute yeah. clip. When Thomas Edison first invented the moving camera and then the movie business, he wanted to take pictures of things that moved. So most people don't even know he went to Hawaii and took movie pictures of circus in Hawaii. And he came to Red Bank to take pictures of the fastest moving man-made machines at the time, ice boats. They were short clips because I think the maximum clip that it could be done on a film there was like 20 minutes. And uh, so this short clip is uh, part of the archives in New Jersey now, and uh, we have a copy of it. We're ready. I'm ready so I can turn out the lights right here. I'll get it. And we'll see this clip of the ice boating of the Navasake River. Go ahead. It's a silent film. <laughs> but this is 1910, is that correct? 1901. 1901, I'm sorry. And this was done from paper negatives, I think. I don't know. That's, that's what I had heard. Okay. That's I don't know that I've done any of the boats, but in 1901, is Greg Strand here? Yes. What boats would be on the river in 1901? Well, there was some talk that the rocket was uh, being shown in one of these videos. I, I, I did, it could have been in here. I didn't see it. But these, these boats are all, some of them are still in existence today. A boat called the TNT and the Daisy. Uh, probably the Georgie's involved here. Some of the very early boats. Right, most of these boats that we're viewing now have only one sail. Yeah, that's, most of the boats you were showing us were I do. Well, the, the teen rig had one sail. See, that's a Latin rig going by there. Two of them. One sail. It had really two masts on a pole, or two poles came up, and, and the a boom swung between them. And that was the, that was the first sails that were actually used around here. They hadn't really got into the boom again until the America's Cup uh, boat started sporting that. Yes, it is paper film collection. <laughs> so the original negatives were in paper, correct? No. The original? They had, in order to copyright the film, they had to make paper prints. Paper prints. And those were in the Library of Congress, and that, that this is what this is taken from. Okay. This is the North Shrewsbury is the original name for the Davisick River. So that's on the postcards. It says North Shrewsbury and pictures of it. See the buildings in the background? That's Marine Park. They had these huge buildings up there. And some of the, the buildings were big warehouses for the tomatoes that were brought in on uh, wagons and, and, and put on the paddle wheel that went back up to New York City. That's a Latin rig boat right there. And I think they're taking some uh, maybe ladies for a ride here. They forget. Now, these boats, when they were designed to go toward the wind pretty good, coming off the wind, I think they had some troubles. There was a paddle wheeler in the background. It may have been the Albertina. They have to push it a little bit to get it going. Greg, 
This is the one that that segment is 1904. Yeah. The, the, the cool thing is, you know, ice boating in those days was sufficient, sufficiently spectacular that people would come out and actually take films like Watch this thing take off with these ladies. There's a guy standing on the, on the side flank. They're amazed to me how, the, how they could take these pictures in, in sub freezing temperatures. Anytime the rice boats out, Edison would send his people out. Oh, there's a bush. To get out. So out there. We do the same thing over on the years later. There's a, there's a good crowd. The, That's not Edison. Well, these are his, these are his Oh, nice job. So he obviously, 1901, 1902, 1903, and 1904. Came back. And there was ice on the river. That means there was ice on the river four years in a row. Yeah. <laughs> skating too. Alan's Landing, that's the old boathouse on the barge. That big pennant there, that, that, they must have won that and they were sporting it out. Here. This is cool. Oh, see you later. <laughs> <laughs> Look how energetic they are. 
They're going to run and get back in there if they can go again. Yeah, no freakers. Run and get this. <laughs> no freakers either. speaker. Uh, I'm very fortunate. Oops. Our next guest speaker, I'm very fortunate. Uh, I know the person about 25 years now. Uh, I married his daughter and during that time uh, he's built about seven boats. Uh, and this last one, the rocket, he's going to show the restoration on. Uh, and it was always great. He'd call me up on a Sunday morning and say, hey Bill, I need your help. And I'd shoot over there, and I'd always, you know, learn something. And I always got the dumb end of the ruler, uh, but I did learn a lot on that, and it was really, really fun. And I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Robert Pulch. Uh, he's uh, 80 years old, and I, I'm hoping I'm in half his shape when I get to his age, because he's in better shape than me right now. Well, Uh, thank you, Bill. Um, once in a while, I do need his help considerably. Uh, it was a pleasure to uh, get involved in this uh, rocket, and uh, really, I um, joined the uh, ice boat club really to work on the rocket because I wasn't an ice boater. I had bought one when I was 70 and never was on an ice boat in my life. But it isn't the first time I did something like that. I built a sailboat, a steel sailboat, and never was on a sailboat. So it's always, it's quite an experience then to, to finish it and say, geez, how am I going to sail this thing? So it's the same thing happened with the uh, ice boat when I bought one, and I still have that. It's a small one, the sea boat. But back to the uh, um, A boats and uh, the rocket. I, uh, Jeff, can I stand over here? Sorry. Yeah, sure. You bet. That's good. Um, this is an old pictures of the um, rocket that uh, John had collected, and he uh, we put it together for uh, presentation. And uh, this is what the only thing we had really. This is the one we um, profile that we took um, from to uh, draw up the blueprints for the new rocket. And. Uh, there is a print over there on the table of what I, I drew up and was hoping it was the uh, come to some uh, dimensions and things that it would sail. And it was fun just to, to go around and talk to these people uh, to get um, the measurements. Okay. <laughs> better yet. Uh, it's better over here. <laughs> Back here? Back, perfect, thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so um, I did uh, go up to uh, uh, New York to get some measurements over. I met John Spur up there and we had a nice um, conversation and went over the rocket, I mean the uh, Jack Frost when we were up there and I got measurements from them. And then also uh, Greg Strand, uh, he worked on the uh, Jack Force and he had some notes and I took those and they, uh, they were very helpful. And then of course, I kind of, I had a schooner hat built or restored and um, it was almost the sail, the same square footage of the sail on the heron as it was on this uh, rocket. So I kind of laid that there and came up with a, uh, some sort of a profile 
plus the photograph here, and then, and then when we went when we went to go get the sales made, uh, Henry Bossett on the shore of sales, North Sales now, uh, he uh, had made the sales for the uh, Jack Frost, and they were within a couple of feet of one another. I said, well, I think we're on the right ballpark. So get ahead of the story a little bit. When we went up there to New York to see if, when we set it up, I was really nervous. <laughs> and it's, it worked out fine. So it, was really, so it was a really exciting affair. And the uh, rocket, this, this is a good picture of the thrust plank there. Uh, let me, uh, this is, we were, last, about two years ago, one of these ends was rotten, was deteriorating really bad. So we were going to replace it, which we did. And we went, um, had a lot of thought and means on whether we were going to replace that, because that was the original historical part of that boat. And of course, they used uh, the same picture that they used to make the thing, the, uh, the, uh, on for the Red Bank, uh, uh, yeah, locals, yes. And then they even made manhole covers. <laughs> so we decided to go with the original. And then of course we got, people would say, well, it wouldn't work right. And, and because this, this timber that went across the top here, where it mired into the uh, bottom part, that's where it sheared, when we took it up there this year, it sheared some of it off. But that was rotted too. And so we have to fix that, which is very fixable. And uh, it worked terrific. But uh, and this is just a photograph. These guys actually, the measurements, they're measuring the sail. And uh, this is another good, great profile of the boat. Look at the people in the background, how small they are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a, it's a big boat. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but th there's a very critical what Greg talked about, is the distance between the plank and the mass step. Here, this distance. And I really didn't have an exact measurement on it. And I was worried about that. So another person I tapped was uh, George Vanier. He's built the, uh, the Vanguard. And I went down to talk with him quite a bit. And he wasn't happy us doing this project. He said, you'll never finish. I wish he was around now to see this <laughs> last March. So maybe he up in heavens was watching this. I, I hope. He was a nice guy, very intelligent person. And uh, he says, well, you think I should put it here? And that's where I put it. And it worked. So I was happy for that fact. And these are just some old time pictures of, uh, yeah, what we were seeing before on the Thomas Edison photographs. And these guys, you know, we had the rocket up about this high this year. <laughs> they, were, they were hanging on it. They had a tiger by the tail, but then they ran into a snowbank and then it just stopped. It was all settled back down. And just the opposite of, of what we were working with, with the rocket and what they worked with back then, but this is a modern scooter now. And it, I mean, it's no comparison. A little tiny bit of sails developed like the wing of an airplane and very aeronautic that it just goes like a shot. So, and now this, this is in the, the basement or underneath our ice boat club. These are some of the cables that was all in a pile and one of the masts was deteriorated beyond recognition almost. And uh, this is some of the stuff we pulled out gave us some idea on building it. And this is the cockpit. And they took that out uh, years before 
we even started on the, the, the restoration there. And this, this is the plank, and this is the rotted ends that we were contending with. So, but we still, we cut it, we had to cut it off back to here on the one end. We have to do the same on the other side there. But, and uh, this is the, the uh, backbone, the keel that uh, we're getting ready, we're cutting that. We had, we had it laminated uh, with epoxy, the planks, because you can't get a, a plank that was big enough now. We're both 40 foot long, two planks bolted together to make the keel up. So here's Frank Johnson, he uh, helped us, and we're just tacking the end of the, the board together so when we get it through and they, they wouldn't shift all over. And this is Mark Peterson. He was very active and helping us. And he's a professional uh, epoxy man, I want to say. Uh, that's all he does for our business. So we're very lucky to have somebody like that to help us. We had so many good people helping us, so many uh, craftsmen. And these are laminating the uh, backbone back together. A new one and getting ready to cut it. And uh, here we are. We got it all laminated together and we boxed, it, laminated the middle and then boxed all around the thing. And here's Jeff showing it up at the end there. Now, this is the bow sprit that we will, will be formed out of that. And then I started forming the um, bow sprit with a jaw knife. And I remember. We were doing it, and Bill Camilla, he's a top-notch engineer, and of course, engineers, you gotta measure everything, and everything has to be figured out. And he says, how did you figure it out? I says, I've just gone, got my jaw knife, and I'm going at it, and we'll see how it turns out. Well, I don't know, we thought too much of that, but it turned out all right, Bill. <laughs> I mean, this is shaking it up, uh, the bow spray then. Nice t-shirt, too. Pardon? Nice t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank God for epoxy adhesive now. Okay, but you know, and this is a uh, a key piece that we put in at an oak. So when we put the two planks together, when they came together, there was something to hold it because it wouldn't just sit on them bolts then and a little twist around, it would finally really work itself tight. So uh, that's the way we did that, we put a key. I think the uh, Jack Frost has that too, doesn't he, yeah. John? Right, yeah, the key. And then uh, we're drilling uh, the bolt holes for the putting the two uh, backbones together. And just keep glue more pieces together and shaping it up. And um, this is, we fitted it all together in the ice boat club, and we just fit it in there all the way to the back door up, down a little passageway. If you come over there, if the people haven't seen the ice boat club, it's, it's quite an interesting place. It's been there for a long time. And here's Jeff just testing it out to see how the, <laughs> it's going to feel in the, in the cockpit. And we got that on there, and we keep that upstairs under um, a glass top and uh, it's the table up there it's been up there quite a while and we just left enough room around the perimeter of the the cockpit people give donations in there <laughs> and they collect quite a bit of money over time and now we're bringing it out for assembling to see how it all goes together and of course the last little scraping we had to do to have it slide in and mark he's this Skinny got a little too much epoxy there uh, for it to slide in. But it went together then. It slid right, right in there. And uh, we had a lot of help. That's the great thing. People are so enthusiastic, it's amazing that um, they, when you say well, we need help, we got help. And even putting it away after this year, come back, I was amazed that when they were putting it, to, sleep again for the uh, 
we keep it in the trail, and uh, there must have been 20 people there helping to put the boat away. So it's nice that so many people are interested in doing it. And I guess we're having we got the plans out here, and uh, must have had a little <laughs> discussion on what we should have done or maybe didn't do right or whatever, but it all went together. Yeah. Here is the uh, crew after setting it together and had, had the uh, cockpit on there. The cockpit's quite small compared to the rest of the boat, as you can see. And, uh, and that's a big, good-sized cockpit. John Spurs in there, he, he had to come down from New York all the time to work on it. Sure did, and we sure appreciated it because he got involved in over part ownership or something of a, a winery up there. He bring down a bottle of his uh, Chardonnay. <laughs> <laughs> we really appreciated him coming down. So we have a glass of Chardonnay and a little cheese. He even put cheese and crackers with him. Uh, every Thursday night. Yes, every Thursday night. And we're still working on it every Thursday night. Yeah, I take it Yeah. And now here is some of the wood. The wood is is interesting. To to uh, to get the wood to find the wood now is a problem. It's very hard to get, and you just get it by word of mouth. Who's got what? And this is for getting ready to cut uh, the um, staves for the um, mast and the and the uh, uh, boom and the gaff. And to uh, find, we talked about getting the sick of spruce because that's what mostly they use. Very expensive. We didn't have that much money because we're on a limited budget. And we people donate money to buy and keep us going. And had a, quite a few people donated quite a bit of money to the rocket. So that was a big thing. So we, up in New York State, we went up to get the for the backbone. We built it out of. Um, Northern White Pine, because Mark Peterson owned a, uh, a lumber yard up there in uh, Port Henry, up on the Lake Champlain all the way up. And I went up there to pick the uh, wood up for the backbone, and I'm looking at this uh, dimensional lumber, uh, construction, this construction grade lumber that he had up there. And I said, boy, that is beautiful looking, clear, almost clear uh, white spruce. So, when we went to get ready to uh, start making the mass and bars, I went up there and uh, he had some beautiful white white spruce uh, dimensional lumber. And um, we picked out the best pieces and we brought it back and started uh, cutting it up to make the uh, all the uh, staves because as you'll see in a minute, it's a bird mouth construction on the mast. It isn't, uh, it's a hollow mast. And Bob, it, Bob, so many yards, the, the gap and the boom, were they original or they came from somewhere else? They all built No, all, all the spars was all new, every, every one. And these are, you, you, you cut these and it all clicks together. And it's a sharp operation. Very strong, I would think, too. And uh, then they're glued. But the, the wood, I looked at some of the pieces, had 40 growth rings per inch. Really? I said, them trees must have germinated back in the 14th, 15th century. I said, where would that ever come with? Maybe way up in northern Canada? And um, had no idea. So. Years a couple years later, somebody else said, geez, I, you know, I would like to get some of that wood. So Mark called up his uncle again to see if there was any available. And there wasn't. He said, you're never going to find that wood again. It had come from Russia. They had got all this wood in some sort of a deal with the, the Lend-Lease of World War II. They were shipping this wood over to us. And that's what it was. It came from Russia. And here we are making the, uh, here, you can see the bird's mouth in there, in these pieces. And then we had a, this is a, 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 a jig that we planed the ends of them to taper them. 
to glue them together because we had to glue. I did some of the work over in my shop in Port Monmouth, but we couldn't transport 40 uh, foot lengths of uh, over here to, to start gluing it together. So we, uh, after we got the, the, the scarf, uh, we brought them over here and glued them over in the uh, ice book club. So. And this is a jig that we used and more discussion on <laughs> how we were going to do it. Okay, well. Yes, a lot of hand tools. Yep, a lot of, a lot of, that plane I had that did that, I found that in the antique shop in the Keyport. And they had a lot of antique shops there. But here's the pieces of the scarves uh, that we glued together and getting ready to uh, set it all up. And this is, this, you know, gluing it all together in jigs to make sure it was true and straight. The jig again. I guess Jeff took a lot of these pictures. Yeah, I think so. Mostly all of them. And uh, here we are getting ready to glue it up. We had to make jigs and line the table all up to bench absolutely true from one end to the other. And it was 38 feet long. That's what the mass is. And uh, the help, I mean, we called in again, you know, need help. And of course, we got the help, and these 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 pieces here are where the stays go, and they go inside the mass as you're gluing it up, uh, because the the, uh, the pressure points on that, and you want to you want little things in there, so it wasn't a shear point because if you get a shear point in there, that's where the mass would crack. So we're getting ready, and then here we go. <laughs> and we only got a short time with this epoxy. You, you're gluing up the whole thing zoop, at one time and getting it all together before the epoxy starts setting up. So we made it. And then there was a, a New York um, Star Electric came down and took photographs of us and an article on it gluing it up. And he says, well, how long are we going to be here? I said, not too long, maybe an hour. <laughs> and uh, it was all put together, all tightened up in 45 minutes. With, but we had a, quite a lot of help. Here we are, uh, gluing it all up, putting all the pieces in, and they all went in this, this uh, frame on this long straight back we had. And it's quite, quite interesting. And, Got to move fast. Had two people just steadily uh, fixing the uh, epoxy. Popping them all together. Putting that plug in. But we didn't have tape, we used them. These Spanish windlass, winches or windlasses, you want to call them, we just tied a rope and put a, a tourniquet in there and tighten them all up. <laughs> Very messy operation. And of course, you have to tack it. And that helps, you know, set it. This vibrates a little bit and it really socks in tight then with all that pressure on it. All done. <laughs> and now we plane it down. It's all sanded. Mark, of course, he was in charge of the finishing. And uh, we just got to keep sanding and sanding and sanding. He got, I don't know, maybe he got carried away, but boy, he put some smooth finish on it. Got down to 80 grit. <laughs> he was in, in heaven doing that. 
So this mass is 30% lighter than a Jack Frost mass? Oh, I would think so. Yeah. What do you think, John? Uh, I didn't actually get to hoist it, so I, I couldn't tell you. Uh, you know, we, didn't, we didn't weigh it, but I Ricky think. Lawrence can lift up the Jack Frost mask and lift it up and take it off the step by himself. Mm -hmm. So they're about equal, I guess. So, so it's a hollow well, way. Ricky Lawrence is a man and a half, or two men. <laughs> <laughs> but the Jack Frost is a hollow mask, too? Uh, no, I don't think it is. Well, then this has to be lighter, I would think. <laughs> and here we are again. We had a uh, sail showed all our boats during the winter one time, and the comparison to the, to the uh, rocket, and this is my sea boat there now. Uh, I mean, the, the difference, <laughs> it's amazing. And here, here's the A-boat even, that uh, was being talked about, the difference between the big boat, the A-1 boat and the A-boat. That's about 2,000 pounds, isn't it? Yeah, our boat is about, yes, yes it is, Greg. And of course, here's Mark, and he's laying down nice and relaxed, and I want to, at the end of the movie, when Bill's going to show right after us, uh, it takes about four minutes uh, that uh, Danny Clapp put together. Danny Clapp's going to take us on a ride. Okay, Bill. I, I guess that was it, huh, Bill? Yep. Okay, now... Um, you can get that film out ready. Yeah. One, thing, one thing I want to say about uh, from sailing to Jack Frost, I know that the nose on the boat lifts up and go in the weather, and, and, and boy, does the rocket lift up in the nose. Yeah. And uh, you can't believe how much pressure is on that whole rig. And I remember talking to Bob about it, and building it strong, you know, and, and yeah. extra thick cables and everything, because God forbid this thing ever wants to go over. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but you know, back in. When they designed this boat in 1888, those guys were pretty brilliant people. They were. I mean, even the the, the forestay that goes around on a, on the on the the bow and is on a roller leg, so it's got all that momentum. It just go up and down. It works right there. It's tied back underneath. This this is putting it together now. Easily. 
he does, they can't sheet it in. <laughs> yeah, it, it, we just start to spin here a little bit. Right. Yeah, but then he took care of it. Yeah, he's awesome. Never moving. What did you say, Greg? Forty some? Forty seven on the first run across the river. I was just happy to hell together. <laughs> <laughs> That's the original truss. That's the original plank. Truss, yeah. And a lot of the early boats had that plank. There's, there's more up there. See, they're not pulling in on a sheet at all. They can't. No, they, they got... Is it reef? <laughs> it wasn't reefed at this point, no. It was running 850 square feet, and then they reefed it in and it went faster. Danny oh. says they were hanging off with their life. <laughs> there's only one handle for three guys to grab a hole of. Yeah, but well, we're going to make a bigger handle now. <laughs> Watch this side in here. This is what we're doing. You're flying. You're flying. You know, there's a loose screw in that shot. I noticed that. Right? Yeah. Okay. They made it. Poor, poor Mark. He, he wore out. Yeah. Watch Mark now. <laughs> the power behind that bow, you would really have no idea how oh. you actually get in. <laughs> Bob, you and I were checking it out, and we had doubts about going back out here. Yeah, they sailed it all day long to about 5, 5.30 that night, nonstop. And of course, uh, Ricky Lawrence and his brother, was it Bob, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Danny? Danny. Oh, Danny. Danny. And, uh, and Kevin. Son. They, yeah, they even yeah, took it for a ride. One brother in one boat in the Jack Frost, and the other brother in the Rocket. And they went out there on a, and they just sailed around like two dogs, you know, after each other's tail. They're both about the same speed, ironically. Oh, they sure are, They're I would so, think. So evenly matched, but uh, when we briefed it down to about, about 550 square feet, she was tame, and she kind of laid on the ice, but the wind was coming down a little bit, too. But uh, the jack couldn't reef down, but now they're sending out their sailor to reef it down. Oh, that's cheap. Can you do that? Because <laughs> <laughs> eventually we're going to have to race in it. What speed did you get up to? I think I didn't go that much faster because the wind was starting to come off. I think the second or third reading was 40, it was 48, 49, something yeah, like that. Yeah, went just a little about 50, 50, 50, I think. Yeah, right. just about 50. Hey, Charlie, lights off. Charlie, lights off. What are you doing? Now, yeah. I'm going to tell you something. You know, uh, they said the stud did 109 miles an hour in 1871, and, and she was Latine rig. And, you know, a big group of blow up there on the Hudson River, you know, and especially when you get a long run. You could, but you're in the air. You're in the air at that speed. And I don't think it's possible that they could ever run that kind of speed at 100. I think you're more in tune to 70, 75 miles an hour is probably the max. Now, your skiers today, they could exceed 100 miles an hour, but you saw the difference between the, the, the modern one <coughs> and this thing. But I don't think it's humanly possible to take this thing over 80. No. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's yeah. up to drag. You're going you to yeah. just hit the wall. Yeah. On think. Saturday, that they had four sails with full sail rig and it piped up from about 15 to almost 20 knots and so we put a double reef in the main and then a single reef in the jib so we shortened that sail quite a bit and she actually became faster uh i had sailed on it four times on saturday and i was done i would i looked like mark at the end of the day <laughs> just laying on the ice uh, on sunday it was a lighter air day so we were able to shake the reefs out and sail the boat and Bard College, uh, they're, they're a real hipster college in uh, terms of music. Uh, so five college kids came out on Sunday afternoon and played for hours out on the ice with sheet music for us and they were fantastic and this was put together by uh, the kids at Bard College and it's, it's a great little video of everyone and what's spectacular is they got all the names of the boats 100% correct. <laughs> John, here, why don't you get up there and say something? Because... All right. Uh, this video John, is, he's from New York here, and he's an expert on ice boats. Uh, this video was put together by one of the Hudson River Ice Yacht Club members, uh, Glenn Berger. 
but uh, th th this just happened spontaneously. We, we did not uh, arrange this or anything. The, the kids just showed up and uh, it happened. And uh, that's the way it kind of happens at Astor Point uh, at Ricky's place. Uh, it's very uh, freewheeling and uh, scene. It's just wonderful. I'm so glad that you, you, you finished this boat, Bob. <laughs> when I joined this project, I, said, I always said, you know, what I'd really like to see in my life are two of these big boats sailing together, not just the Jack Frost. And uh, you guys did it. And I'm so happy. That's the Jack Frost, right? That's yeah. the Frost, yeah. The rocket's in the background. Yeah, the rocket is the only She's one that free. had numbers on it, it's 1888, that was the year it went built. She did pretty even. Yeah. You guys never put a flag on it. Well, we got it, we'll get there. <laughs> Bob's going to have to climb the mast. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the music is fantastic. Yeah, isn't it? They yeah. played for a couple hours. Just went on and on. Beautiful shot there. See that skeg in front of the rear runner? It's there in case you hit a crack or a hummock. It kicks it up so you don't take the rudder off. <laughs> That's Glenn's boat. Glenn is sailing his own boat here in his own video. These are uh, boats from local estates, uh, the Hound, and there's another one, a sister ship, the Greyhound, which is also on the ice. I think that was the Vixen that just peeled off in front of them. That's the, uh, the Jersey Fleet. Oh, that's, that's our area. That's right? the your area. Yeah. Yeah. And that was a Rogers boat. Uh, the owner of the Jack Frost had that boat. He loved that It's beautiful up there in the Hudson. This is just one of those rare years. Uh, just, just to drive down a driveway is spectacular. Just to drive. Yeah, to get there. <laughs> the beaver on the bridge. Except the mud. <laughs> Except the mud going back. Yeah. I think the beaver came from uh, Jack, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. They came from Jack. They have it up in the ice boat. Here's the Benson, the Lactine rig. Probably 400 people a day on the ice there. The boats get kept getting out in the middle of the river so we wouldn't hit people when they came in, and the people just kept falling, you know? <laughs> we're, out, we're on the east side. The west side had the channel open up by the icebreaker for all right, the freight, freight, freight stuff. There are yeah. tugs and barges going through. I mean, you don't yeah. realize that, but actually tugs and barges going through the river while you're sailing. There. Yeah, it's a very active river. You know, they're sailing oil up and down nowadays. down the river. And Saturday night we had a full-fledged banquet up there in the uh, old house or castle, what are they called now? That's John A. Astor's no, mansion. Mansion. <laughs> uh, John M. Gannon from our club here, he uh, is a culinary graduate, school graduate, and he went up two days ahead of time and cooked this fantastic uh, meal for us. 120 pounds of chicken. Yeah. <laughs> Out of this world. Then have a band up. like this on Sunday, serenaders. What more do you want, Mike? There were oysters on the ice. Uh, I guess, in, I guess that oysters. was the perfect weekend when you get down to it, you know. You, yeah. you, you work so hard, and there it is. You know? Well, you know, the amazing thing is we had to schedule for March 1st or whatever. There, there it is. You know, March 1st, whatever it was. And, and, and you know, then this happened. But think about it. We could have had this conference without these videos. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we could have been sitting here. Channel, yeah. Somebody were pretty close. 
the Is there a ledge there? There was one driveway down to Astor Point, but they made a second one down to help everybody get in and out. Look at the size of this thing. <laughs> it actually moves the ice when it goes by. You can race that one. Ice win. Wave, right? Yeah. 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 I was out there talking to one of the Lawrence brothers. The train just happened to go by. And I said, boy, can you believe they were racing that train? He goes, what are you talking about? I was racing it just the other day. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, really? He goes, yeah. Because where they're reaching, going, following the tracks this way. Yeah. And I said, I can't believe you guys were actually racing that train. <laughs> oh, yeah, we were racing it. Well, thank you, John. One more, or do you want to see the rocket launch video one more time? Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to see another video. The rocket okay. launch video is easy to win. So, this is a video that's up on YouTube. That's what's bad about this sport. I've been to a, a lake five times in five weekends and have no win. All in a row. You can win when you get it. So, March 1st was the best day ever. Nice drone, but you brought a helicopter? Yeah, he's got a drone. Yeah, drone, 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 right. You've seen a drop in that little. Actually, see the crack there? Yeah, I was just going to ask. Expansion crack. Well, what is this thing together? This was an actual helicopter. What is it taking? Oh, damn. A drone. A remote control helicopter. A drone. Yeah. A drone. Yeah. Camera drone. Really? Just like the NSA. By the way, you see that vehicle pulling that ice boat? That's a scratcher. Thank God we decided to bring that to the last minute. Because pulling where you see the people way in the background? Is that your turn? That's a long push for those heavy boats. Yeah, mine was in the shop that day, unfortunately. Wow. Look at that shot. Is that a spectacular wow. shot? That's incredible. Well, Ricky Aldrich, who 
is the custodial carekeeper of uh, Rokeby. He, he was wonderful, helping us out with tractors to get the trailers back out of the mud and back up the hill. And his house up to get his house up. It was just phenomenal, right? Yeah. The following Friday, we finally got everything off the ice, slapping up through the mud. Well, I hope everybody had a great time today seeing the symposium. This not only was a historic month for launching the rocket, but this was a historic symposium putting all these people together. And I want to thank all the members at the North Shrewsbury Ice Boat Club, our presenters, Greg Strand, Bob Polish, Phil Carton, Jeff Smith, for helping us to organize this. And I hope that you will all come for our next Navasig Maritime Heritage Association presentation, which will be April 23rd in about four weeks, when Tom Gibson will present on the restoration of the Garvey, which after 28 years is being donated to Tuckerton Museum, and the Garvey that has been on the river. So that will be another historic event on April 23rd. April 23rd, on a Wednesday night. So, and where will it be? It will be at, at Monmouth Beach Cultural Center on April 23rd. And you'll be getting an email on that. So at the conclusion of today's meeting, now I want to announce that the North Shrewsbury Ice Boat Club has been opened. I guess, Greg, you opened it up? Yeah, it's open. Yeah. It's open, and they're ready to take anyone who wants on tours of the upstairs and downstairs of the North Shrewsbury Ice Boat Club for this When you time. go downstairs, you can, see the, uh, you can see the old lockers that are down there that they have the names on them. The rocket's one of them, but all the old boats' names are on the lockers from 100 years ago. And then there's a very steep staircase there, and it says no creepers allowed. It doesn't say creeps. You know, I can't go up anymore. <laughs> it's, the creepers are the things we walk on the ice with. So, But upstairs has never really been changed. When I joined the club in 1968, it's had the uh, uh, potbelly stoves. We didn't have a furnace. We didn't have bathrooms. We had a two uh, hole or outhouse in the back of the building there. But it's been modernized just to that extent and maybe the kitchen. But everything else is a, a, identical the way it was since 1880. You go into the main meeting hall, look up at all the pictures. You'll be flabbergasted at the history that's in the sides of, of the ceilings. But everything has never been changed yet. Great. A question. Do you know, is there a directory of existing that lists all these old ice boats? Well, right. we have minutes. Well, the Hudson River has tremendous records of the old boats, and it has uh, Lloyd's, Lloyd's uh, registry uh, had uh, put down all the yachts because they were considered yachts. And, and so there, there are uh, records of, of the boats at, that turn, at, the, at the turn of the century, maybe up into the uh, 20s. We have minutes from our club that are uh, stored in the uh, facility out in uh, Monmouth County. Long Branch has a wonderful book called the Shrewsbury River Memoirs that has all the uh, names and times and, and uh, the crews of the boats that sailed. So it's all documented, but our records are kind of locked up in, 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 in there. We're trying to get a landmark decision uh, a status over there, not a historical thing, but a landmark. I've worked hard on it with uh, Bill Camello to try to, you know, get that preserved, that building over there. But, uh, yeah, there, there are, uh, you know, unfortunately all the old timers are gone and I was lucky enough to have been uh, cognizant enough to listen to these guys when I was a kid. I interviewed, I used to take tape recordings of all the old members that we had in the club and get their stories and I put it on video uh, cassettes. And uh, one of the most amazing was a nine-year-old boy who, when I interviewed him, was 95. And he used to ride a bicycle from Point Pleasant, be one of the live ballasts on, on the Scud. And he was paid a dollar a day, but he'd ride his bicycle up from Point Pleasant. I was just absolutely moved by this. But we, we have it uh, documented, yeah, the boats and everything. We try to. But uh, that's what we got to do for the future is keep this thing alive as each member dies out. We're talking about getting a storage container so we can bring boats here to the facility of owners that have them stashed at their homes that, and, and they're never going to be sailed again and kind of talk to them about bringing it here into a safe environment and having them sail again. But, you know, you know ice boating is dangerous. It's inherently dangerous and, you know, people can get hurt. So there's a lot of liability that you have to worry about down the road. So. But go over there and enjoy, get the feel of that place. It, it was magnificent. When I first joined the club, the old timers would not let me up past the, 
the stair in the kitchen and i don't know what was going on but they all had their assigned seats you know and they all sat in the same spot and nobody you know, nobody would talk about what they did for a living and it, they were ice boaters once you came into that chamber you were an ice boater only an ice boater and then when i finally got to sail my boat for the first time and there was a secret how to get out of the pit area here and go by uh, marine park and I, I i ended up losing control of the boat like three or four times and they finally put me over to the side and said, you know, you're going to kill yourself, so we better tell you how to get out of here. <laughs> and so they did, and uh, it opened up all the doors, and I just listened to everything they had to tell me and soaked it all up. And, uh, and fortunately, you know, but now I'm, I'm 45 years into that club over there, and things are waning for me, and I'm hoping other people feel the same feeling that I had and continue it on. Ch Channing Irwin is a tremendous influence in our, on our club. And helping out, but we got guys like you know Jeff here that is documenting a lot of the uh, material for future generations. Enjoy that club over there. Great, thanks, Greg. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Have a great afternoon, great weekend, and enjoy the North Shore Club. Thank you. 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 Thank you.